Chapters 5, 6, and 7 of The Red Battle Flyer by Captain Manfred Freiherr von Richthofen. Translated by T. Ellis Barker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 5. My First Solo Flight. 10th October, 1915. There are some moments in one's life which tickle one's nerves particularly, and the first solo flight is among them. One fine evening my teacher, Zoomer, told me, Now go and fly by yourself. I must say I felt like replying, I am afraid. But this is a word which should never be used by a man who defends his country. Therefore, whether I liked it or not, I had to make the best of it and get into my machine. Zoomer explained to me once more every movement in theory. I scarcely listened to his explanations, for I was firmly convinced that I should forget half of what he was telling me. I started the machine. The aeroplane went at the prescribed speed, and I could not help noticing that I was actually flying. After all, I did not feel timorous, but rather elated. I did not care for anything. I should not have been frightened, no matter what happened. With contempt of death I made a large curve to the left, stopped the machine near a tree exactly where I had been ordered to, and looked forward to see what would happen. Now came the most difficult thing, the landing. I remembered exactly what movements I had to make. I acted mechanically, and the machine moved quite differently from what I had expected. I lost my balance, made some wrong movements, stood on my head, and I succeeded in converting my aeroplane into a battered school bus. I was very sad, looked at the damage which I had done to the machine, which, after all, was not very great, and had to suffer from other people's jokes. Two days later I went with passion at the flying, and suddenly I could handle the apparatus. A fortnight later I had to take my first examination. Herr von T. was my examiner. I described the figure eight several times, exactly as I had been told to do, landed several times with success in accordance with orders received, and felt very proud of my achievements. However, to my great surprise, I was told that I had not passed. There was nothing to be done but to try once more to pass the initial examination. My Training Time at Dorbritz in order to pass my examinations, I had to go to Berlin. I made use of the opportunity to go to Berlin as observer in a giant plane. I was ordered to go by aeroplane to Dobritz near Berlin on the 15th of November, 1915. In the beginning, I took a great interest in the giant plane. But funnily enough, the gigantic machine made it clear to me that only the smallest aeroplane would be of any use for me in battle. A big aerial barge is too clumsy for fighting. Agility is needed, and after all, fighting is my business. The difference between a large battle plane and a giant plane is that a giant plane is considerably larger than a large battle plane, and that it is more suitable for use as a bomb carrier than a fighter. I went through my examinations in Dorbritz together with a dear fellow, First Lieutenant von Lichtner. We get on very well with one another had the same inclinations and the same ideas as to our future activity. Our aim was to fly Fokkers and to be included in a battle squadron on the Western Front. A year later we succeeded in working together for a short time. A deadly bullet hit my dear friend when bringing down his third aeroplane. We passed many merry hours in Dorbritz. One of the things which we had to do was to land in strange quarters. I used this opportunity to combine the necessary with the agreeable. My favorite landing place outside of our aerodrome was the Bukau estate, where I was well known. I was there invited to shoot wild pigs. The matter could be combined only with difficulty with the service, for on fine evenings I wished both to fly and to shoot pigs. So I arranged for a place of landing in the neighborhood of Bukau, whence I could easily reach my friends. I took with me a second pilot who served as an observer and sent him back in the evening. During the night I shot pigs and on the next morning was fetched by my pilot. If I had not been fetched with the aeroplane, I should have been in a hole 
for I should have had to march on foot a distance of about six miles. So I required a man who would fetch me in any weather. It is not easy to find a man who will fetch you under any circumstances. Once, when I had passed the night trying to shoot pigs, a tremendous snowfall set in. One could not see fifty yards ahead. My pilot was to fetch me at eight sharp. I hoped that for once he would not come. But suddenly I heard a humming noise, one could not see a thing, and five minutes later my beloved bird was squatting before me on the ground. Unfortunately, some of his bones had got bent. I become a pilot. On Christmas Day, 1915, I passed my third examination. In connection with it, I flew to Schwerin, where the Fokker works are situated, and had a look at them. As observer, I took with me my mechanic, and from Schwerin I flew with him to Breslau, from Breslau to Schweidnitz, from thence to Lüben, and then returned to Berlin. During my tour I landed in lots of different places in between, visiting relatives and friends. Being a trained observer, I did not find it difficult to find my way. In March 1916, I joined the 2nd Battle Squadron before Verdun and learned air fighting as a pilot. I learned how to handle a fighting airplane. I flew then a two-seater. In the official communique of the 26th of April 1916, I am referred to for the first time, although my name is not mentioned. Only my deeds appear in it. I had built into my machine a machine gun, which I had arranged very much in the same way in which it is done in the Nupa machines. I was very proud of my idea. People laughed at the way I had fitted it up because the whole thing looked very primitive. Of course, I swore by my new arrangement, and very soon I had an opportunity of ascertaining its practical value. I encountered a hostile Nupa machine which was apparently guided by a man who also was a beginner for he acted extremely foolishly. When I flew towards him, he ran away. Apparently he had trouble with his gun. I had no idea of fighting him but thought, what will happen if I now start shooting? I flew after him, approached him as closely as possible, and then began firing a short series of well-aimed shots with my machine gun. The Nupa reared up in the air and turned over and over. At first both my observer and I believed that this was one of the numerous tricks which French flyers habitually indulge in. However, his tricks did not cease. Turning over and over, the machine went lower and lower. At last my observer patted me on the head and called out to me, I congratulate you, he is falling. As a matter of fact, he fell into the forest behind Fort Duemon and disappeared among the trees. It became clear to me that I had shot him down, but on the other side of the front. I flew home and reported merely. I had an aerial fight and have shot down a Nupa. The next day I read of my action in the official communique. Of course I was very proud of my success, but that Nupa does not figure among the fifty-two aeroplanes which I have brought down. The communique of the 26th of April stated, Two hostile flying machines had been shot down by aerial fighting above Fleury, south and west of Douaumont. Hulk's Death, 30th of April, 1916 As a young pilot, I once flew over Fort Douaumont at a moment when it was exposed to a violent drum fire. I noticed that a German Fokker was attacking three quadrant machines. It was my misfortune that a strong west wind was blowing. That was not favorable to me. The Fokker was driven over the town of Verdun in the course of the fight. I drew the attention of my observer to the struggle. He thought that the German fighting man must be a very smart fellow. We wondered whether it could be Bolka and intended to inquire when we came down. Suddenly I saw to my horror that the German machine, which previously had attacked, had fallen back upon the defensive. The strength of the French fighting men had been increased to at least ten, and their combined assaults forced the German machine to go lower and lower. I could not fly to the Germans' aid. I was too far away from the battle. Besides, my heavy machine could not overcome the strong wind against me. The Fokker fought with despair. His opponents had rushed him down to an altitude of only about eighteen hundred feet. 
Suddenly he was once more attacked by his opponents, and he disappeared, plunging into a small cloud. I breathed more easily, for in my opinion the cloud had saved him. When I arrived at the aerodrome I reported what I had seen, and was told that the Fokker was Count Holk, my old comrade in the Eastern Theater of War. Count Holk had dropped straight down, shot through the head. His death deeply affected me, for he was my model. I tried to imitate his energy, and he was a man among men also as a character. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 I Fly in a Thunderstorm Our activity before Verdun was disturbed in the summer of 1916 by frequent thunderstorms. Nothing is more disagreeable for flying men than to have to go through a thunderstorm. In the Battle of Le Somme, a whole English flying squadron came down behind our lines and became prisoners of war because they had been surprised by a thunderstorm. I had never yet made an attempt to get through thunderclouds, but I could not suppress my desire to make the experiment. During the whole day, thunder was in the air. From my base at Mont, I had flown over to the fortress of Metz nearby in order to look after various things. During my return journey, I had an adventure. I was at the aerodrome of Metz and intended to return to my own quarters. When I pulled my machine out of the hangar, the first storms of an approaching thunderstorm became noticeable. Clouds, which looked like gigantic pitch-black wall, approached from the north. Older experienced pilots urged me not to fly. However, I had promised to return, and I should have considered myself a coward if I had failed to come back because of a silly thunderstorm. Therefore, I meant to try. When I started, the rain began falling. I had to throw away my goggles, otherwise I should not have seen anything. The trouble was that I had to travel over the mountains of the Moselle, where the thunderstorm was just raging. I said to myself that probably I should be lucky and get through, and rapidly approach the black cloud which reached down to the earth. I flew at the lowest possible altitude. I was compelled absolutely to leap over houses and trees with my machine. Very soon I knew no longer where I was. The gale seized my machine as if it were a piece of paper and drove it along. My heart sank within me. I could not land among the hills. I was compelled to go on. I was surrounded by an inky blackness. Beneath me the trees bent down in the gale. Suddenly I saw right in front of me a wooded height. I could not avoid it. My albatross managed to take it. I was able to fly only in a straight line. Therefore I had to take every obstacle that I encountered. My flight became a jumping competition, purely and simply. I had to jump over trees, villages, spires and steeples, for I had to keep within a few yards of the ground, otherwise I should have seen nothing at all. The lightning was playing around me. At that time I did not know that lightning cannot touch flying machines. I felt certain of my death, for it seemed to me inevitable that the gale would throw me at any moment into a village or a forest. Had the motor stopped working, I should have been done for. Suddenly I saw that on the horizon the darkness had become less thick. Over there the thunderstorm had passed. I would be saved if I were able to get so far. Concentrating all my energy, I steered towards the light. Suddenly I got out of the thundercloud. The rain was still falling in torrents. Still I felt saved. In pouring rain I landed at my aerodrome. Everyone was waiting for me, for Metz had reported my start and had told them that I had been swallowed up by a thundercloud. I shall never again fly through a thunderstorm unless the fatherland should demand this. Now when I looked back I realized that it was all very beautiful. Notwithstanding the danger during my flight, I experienced glorious moments which I would not care to have missed. My First Time in a Fokker From the beginning of my career as a pilot I had only a single ambition, the ambition to fly in a single-seater battle plane. After worrying my commander for a long time, I at last obtained permission to mount a Fokker. The revolving motor was a novelty to me. Besides, it was a strange feeling to be 
quite alone during the flight. The Fokker belonged jointly to a friend of mine who has died long ago and to myself. I flew in the morning and he in the afternoon. Both he and I were afraid that the other fellow would smash the box. On the second day we flew towards the enemy. When I flew in the morning no Frenchman was to be seen. In the afternoon it was his turn. He started but did not return. There was no news from him. Late in the evening the infantry reported an aerial battle between a Nupo and a German Fokker, in the course of which the German machine had apparently landed at the Mort home. Evidently the occupant was friend Ryman, for all the other flying men had returned. We regretted the fate of our brave comrade. Suddenly in the middle of the night we heard over the telephone that a German flying officer had made an unexpected appearance in the front trenches at the Mort home. It appeared that this was Ryman. His motor had been smashed by a shot. He had been forced to land. As he was not able to reach our own lines, he had come to the ground in no man's land. He had rapidly set fire to the machine and had then quickly hidden himself in a mine crater. During the night he had slunk into our trenches. Thus ended our joint enterprise with a Fokker. A few days later I was given another Fokker. This time I felt under a moral obligation to attend to its destruction myself. I was flying for the third time. When starting, the motor suddenly stopped working. I had to land right away in a field, and in a moment the beautiful machine was converted into a mass of scrap metal. It was a miracle that I was not hurt. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Bombing in Russia In June we were suddenly ordered to entrain. No one knew where we were going, but we had an idea, and we were not overmuch surprised when our commander told us that we were going to Russia. We had traveled through the whole of Germany with our perambulating hotel, which consisted of dining and sleeping cars, and arrived at last at Koval. There we remained on our railway cars. There are many advantages to dwelling in a train. One is always ready to travel on, and need not change one's quarters. In the heat of the Russian summer a sleeping car is the most horrible instrument of martyrdom imaginable. Therefore I agreed with some friends of mine, Gerstenberg and Scheel, to take quarters in the forest nearby. We erected a tent and lived like gypsies. We had a lovely time. In Russia our battle squadron did a great deal of bomb-throwing. Our occupation consisted of annoying the Russians. We dropped our eggs on their finest railway establishments. One day our whole squadron went out to bomb a very important railway station. The place was called Manjewitz and was situated about twenty miles behind the front. That was not very far. The Russians had planned an attack, and the station was absolutely crammed with colossal trains. Trains stood close to one another. Miles of rails were covered with them. One could easily see that from above. There was an object for bombing that was worth wild. One can become enthusiastic over anything. For a time I was delighted with bomb-throwing. It gave me a tremendous pleasure to bomb those fellows from above. Frequently I took part in two expeditions on a single day. On the day mentioned our objects was Manjewitz. Everything was ready. The aeroplanes were ready to start. Every pilot tried his motor for it is a painful thing to be forced to land against one's will on the wrong side of the front line, especially in Russia. The Russians hated the flyers. If they caught a flying man they would certainly kill him. That is the only risk one ran in Russia, for the Russians had no aviators, or practically none. If a Russian flying man turned up he was sure to have bad luck and would be shot down. The anti-aircraft guns used by Russia were sometimes quite good, but they were too few in number. Compared with flying in the West, flying in the East is absolutely a holiday. The aeroplanes rolled heavily to the starting point. They carried bombs to the very limit of their capacity. Sometimes I dragged three hundred pounds of bombs with a normal sea machine. Besides, I had with me a very heavy observer who apparently had not suffered in any way from the food scarcity. 
I had also with me a couple of machine guns. I was never able to make a proper use of them in Russia. It is a pity that my collection of trophies contains not a single Russian. Flying with a heavy machine which is carrying a great dead weight is no fun, especially during the midday summer heat in Russia. The barges sway in a very disagreeable manner. Of course, heavily laden though they are, they do not fall down. The 150 horsepower motors prevent it. At the same time, it is no pleasant sensation to carry such a large quantity of explosives and benzene. At last we get into a quiet atmosphere. Now comes the enjoyment of bombing. It is splendid to be able to fly in a straight line and to have a definite object and definite orders. After having thrown one's bombs, one has the feeling that he has achieved something, while frequently, after searching for an enemy to give battle to, one comes home with a sense of failure at not having brought a hostile machine to the ground. Then a man is apt to say to himself, you have acted stupidly. It gave me a good deal of pleasure to throw bombs. After a while my observer learned how to fly perpendicularly over the objects to be bombed and to make use of the right moment for laying his egg with the assistance of his aiming telescope. The run to Manuvites is very pleasant, and I have made it repeatedly. We passed over gigantic forests which were probably inhabited by elks and lynxes, but the villages looked miserable. The only substantial village in the whole neighborhood was Manuvites. It was surrounded by innumerable tents, and countless barracks had been run up near the railway station we could not make out the Red Cross. Another flying squadron had visited the place before us. That could be told by the smoking houses and barracks. They had not done badly. The exit of the station had obviously been blocked by a lucky hit. The engine was still steaming. The engine driver had probably dived into a shelter. On the other side of the station an engine was just coming out. Of course I felt tempted to hit it. We flew towards the engine and dropped a bomb a few hundred yards in front of it. We had the desired result. The engine stopped. We turned and continued throwing bomb after bomb on the station, carefully taking aim through our aiming telescope. We had plenty of time, for nobody interfered with us. It is true that an enemy aerodrome was in the neighborhood, but there was no trace of hostile pilots. A few anti-aircraft guns were busy, but they shot not in our direction, but in another one. We reserved a bomb, hoping to make particularly good use of it on our way home. Suddenly we noticed an enemy flying machine starting from its hangar. The question was whether it would attack us. I did not believe in an attack. It was more likely that the flying man was seeking security in the air, for when bombing machines are about, the air is the safest place. We went home by roundabout ways and looked for camps. It was particularly amusing to pepper the gentlemen down below with machine guns. Half-savage tribes from Asia are even more startled when fired at from above than are cultured Englishmen. It is particularly interesting to shoot at hostile cavalry. An aerial attack upsets them completely. Suddenly the lot of them rush away in all directions of the compass. I should not like to be the commander of a squadron of Cossacks which has been fired at with machine guns from aeroplanes. By and by we could recognize the German lines. We had to dispose of our last bomb, and we resolved to make a present of it to a Russian observation balloon, to the only observation balloon they possessed. We could quite comfortably descend to with a few hundred yards of the ground in order to attack it. At first the Russians began to haul it in very rapidly. When the bomb had been dropped, the hauling stopped. I did not believe that I had hit it. I rather imagined that the Russians had left their chief in the air and had run away. At last we reached our front in our trenches, and were surprised to find when we got home that we had been shot at from below. At least one of the planes had a hole in it. Another time, and in the same neighborhood, we were ordered to meet an attack of the Russians who intended to cross the river Stockholm. We came to the danger spot laden with bombs and carrying a large number of cartridges for our machine guns. On arrival at the stockhold we were surprised to see that hostile cavalry was already crossing. They were passing over a single bridge. 
Immediately it was clear to us that one might do a tremendous lot of harm to the enemy by hitting the bridge. Dense masses of men were crossing. We went as low as possible and could clearly see the hostile cavalry crossing by way of the bridge with great rapidity. The first bomb fell near the bridge. The second and third followed immediately. They created a tremendous disorder. The bridge had not been hit. Nevertheless, traffic across it had completely ceased. Men and animals were rushing away in all directions. We had thrown only three bombs, but the success had been excellent. Besides, a whole squadron of aeroplanes was following us. Lastly, we could do other things. My observer fired energetically into the crowd down below with his machine gun, and we enjoyed it tremendously. Of course, I cannot say what real success we had. The Russians have not told us. Still, I imagine that I alone had caused the Russian attack to fail. Perhaps the official account of the Russian War Office will give me details after the war. At last. The August sun was almost unbearably hot on the sandy flying ground at Kovo. While we were chatting among ourselves, one of my comrades said, Today the great Polka arrives on a visit to us, or rather to his brother. In the evening the great man came to hand. He was vastly admired by all, and he told us many interesting things about his journey to Turkey. He was just returning from Turkey and was on his way to headquarters. He imagined that he would go to the Somme to continue his work. He was to organize a flying squadron. He was empowered to select from the flying corps those men who seemed to him particularly qualified for his purpose. I did not dare to ask him to be taken on. I did not feel bored by the fighting in Russia. On the contrary, we made extensive and interesting flights. We bombed the Russians at their stations. Still, the idea of fighting again on the Western Front attracted me. There is nothing finer for a young cavalry officer than the chase of the air. The next morning Volka was to leave us. Quite early somebody knocked at my door, and before me stood the great man with the André Pour Le Marie. I knew him, as I have previously mentioned, but still I had never imagined that he came to look me up in order to ask me to become his pupil. I almost fell upon his neck when he inquired whether I cared to go with him to the Somme. Three days later I sat in the railway train and traveled through the whole of Germany straight away to the new field of my activity. At last my greatest wish was fulfilled. From now onwards began the finest time of my life. At that time I did not dare to hope that I should be as successful as I have been. When I left my quarters in the East, a good friend of mine called out after me, See that you do not come back without the entre pour les maris. End of chapter 7 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks.com